Welcome everyone. And thank you for joining us today for this presentation on Brownfields Liability Relief Programs. We're very excited to have our guest speakers, Mark Lewis, the Brownfields Coordinator for the DEEP, Benu Chandy, the Deputy Director of the DECD's Office of Brownfield Remediation and Development, and Alexandra Dom, the Deputy Commissioner of the DECD. Assisting us with this presentation is Alicia Washington, Director of Marketing at HRP, Alicia will be managing the Zoom platform in the background over the next hour. I am Scott Kuhn, your moderator today and a vice president and practice leader with HRP. I'm very pleased to be hosting this event. The redevelopment of brownfields continues to be so important, revitalizing distressed properties while creating substantial economic value for local communities. I've had the pleasure of working with Mark and Benu over the years and I'm always impressed by their forward thinking and the added value they bring to all the Connecticut redevelopment projects. Just a few housekeeping items before we get started today. There'll be a lot of content presented over the next hour. We ask that everyone keep your cameras off and remain muted during the presentation so that we can finish on time. If you think of questions that you would like to ask, please type them into the chat, which is located at the bottom of your Zoom screen. At the end of the presentation, I will field questions to the speakers. For any questions not addressed during the Q&A session, we will provide answers via email after the presentation. If you are having technical difficulties or have need of assistance, feel free to privately message Alicia Washington in the chat and she will take care of your request. Without further ado. Good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you to Scott and Alicia for organizing this event. And thanks to all of you for signing up. In today's presentation, I'm going to talk about why DCD is involved with Brownfield Redevelopment, our mission and accomplishments, our current programs and funding opportunities, and some success stories. So in the past, factories and mills drove the creation and growth of Connecticut cities and towns. Many of these facilities operated before the existence of environmental laws, thus leaving behind significant environmental contamination and hazardous waste. And in many cases, these properties have been left abandoned for decades and the original polluter is long, long gone. There are thousands of such abandoned and dilapidated properties languishing in nearly every city and town in Connecticut. These sites are market failures requiring public investment to be resolved, and that is where DCD, with its mission for economic and community development, steps in. Now, cleaning up Connecticut's brownfields is an important component of our agency's economic development agenda. By cleaning up brownfields and encouraging brownfield redevelopment, we are creating jobs and economic growth, addressing public health issues, helping with downtown revitalization, conserving open space, agricultural lands and green fields, and assisting with historic preservation. Now our office's main mission is to offer financial and technical assistance for brownfield redevelopment and to bring back as many sites to full economic health and productivity. The state has been consistently committed to brownfield redevelopment since 2011, we have invested over 200 million in brownfield redevelopment, taken up over 230 investigation and cleanup projects in over 72 municipalities. We have assessed or cleaned up 3,000 acres, that is the size of the city of Derby. And in the course of doing so, we have created approximately 15,000 construction jobs and 3,000 permanent jobs. Over the last few years, we've had a robust program our office is a one-stop shop for all things related to brownfield redevelopment, and we work in close collaboration with the DEEP, other state agencies, and the EPA. Now, this map demonstrates the extent of our funding impact across the state. Moving on to our programs and funding opportunities, over the years, we've developed a suite of tools to help with brownfield investigations, remediation and redevelopment. We have our two funding programs, the grant and the loan program, the liability relief program and the brownfield land bank program. Now, Mark Lewis from DEEP will be covering the liability relief programs. 
I would first like to focus on our two funding programs and the recent grant and loan offerings that we announced. The two programs rely on legislative authorizations and in the past few years, we've steadily been receiving approvals of approximately 20 million per year to fund these programs. Since today's audience I believe is mostly developers, I'll first start with the targeted Brownfield Development Loan Program. Now this program was set up to attract potential developers to undertake Brownfield redevelopment by offering low interest loans, something which banks may be reluctant to offer. Financing for redevelopment of sites where there are contamination issues due to the unpredictability of receiving regulatory approval from D. In the past, developers could walk into DCD and request a loan under this program. An application form had to be filled out along with a redevelopment plan. DCD would award the funds as long as the project was competitive in terms of economic development and satisfied some basic underwriting criteria. The issue with that approach is that we were not able to control availability of funds. Often a good project would come forward but there may, may have been no funding available. Also, projects were not compared against each other. So now we are moving to a competitive rounds model for this program, where we are hoping to schedule two regular, model, uh, two regular rounds per year. So we recently announced a loan round, that's round 13 on December 21st. The deadline for the pre-applications just passed, it was January 25th. The award decisions will be made by the end of April, and we're expecting to announce the next loan round sometime in May, June of this year. So some of the features of the loan program are that it's open to potential brownfield purchasers and property owners who are not responsible for the property contamination. Uh, the maximum loan amount uh, that can be awarded is 4 million or the uh, maximum loan amount that you can apply for is 4 million. The offered rate in this current round is 3% with flexible uh, deferred repayment that can be negotiated on a case by case basis. The loan term offered is up to a maximum of 30 years to match the private debt financing terms. The minimum debt service co coverage ratio that is the gross rents minus certain expenses has to be 1.15. Other criteria that we do not offer uh, loan forgiveness in round 13, although there is statutory provision for the commissioner to offer that in future rounds. The loan will have to be fully repaid on permanent refinancing and we are requiring a minimum developer equity of at least 10% of the total project cost. So equity could include assessment costs, local bonding, cash, administrative expenses, pre-development expenses, property acquisition costs, deferred developer fee and other investments by the applicant. Now the scoring criteria for selection of a project, uh, the total is uh, out of hundred points. Uh, this includes 20 points for shovel readiness, uh, which includes completeness of the remediation and redevelopment plan, 40 points for economic and community development impact, uh, whether a project is located in a distressed municipality, a targeted investment community, public investment community or opportunity zone, increase in property value, tax contributions, job creation, support of DCD's other economic initiatives and economic development strategy. Now, 30 points for financing details, uh, that's the loan to value ratio, the developer equity and private leverage of DCD funds, and 10 points for applicant experience with completing similar projects on time and within budget. The bottom line is that this year, it will be more focused on the primary mission of bringing brownfields back to economic productivity, how the project benefits the community and maximizing the rate of return on taxpayers' investments. By the way, there is a statutory requirement under our brownfield program that we give preference to projects in opportunity zones and Deputy Commissioner Daum will be talking about the opportunity zone program in her presentation. Now our funding is very flexible. Eligible users run the gamut from investigation, abatement, demolition, disposal, remediation, institution controls, planning, attorney fees, and building and structural issues. So moving on to the grant program, uh, developers are not eligible to receive grants directly under the municipal grant program. However, 
Developers are welcome to partner with grant eligible entities such as municipalities, economic development agencies, brownfield land banks, et cetera. So we are highly encouraging these public-private uh, partnerships. Uh, we have noticed that successful and cost-efficient brownfield redevelopment projects are those that have a developer with a redevelopment plan. So the round 13 deadline for submission of the grant pre-application form is February 16th. So there is still time to submit a pre-app under the grant program for this round. The funding availability in this round is 9.5 million. And in this round, the maximum possible amount that you can request for is 2 million and uh, compared to the loan program, which is 4 million. So the scoring criteria for the grant program is very similar to the loan program. Uh, we have uh, 10 additional points if a developer has been identified and the applicant's team's uh, skin in the game is considered also. That is the applicant or the developer team's contribution also carries weight. Now, for those familiar with our previous application process, I want to highlight some of the latest changes. For starters, we have new application forms. Please visit our website, which is www.ctbrownfields.gov and go to the respective program pages. We're also introducing a pre-application step where we will be filtering projects based on statutory eligibility. So you will see questions such as, is the project a brownfield? Is a potential applicant responsible for contamination? Will, will the potential applicant have access to the property to do the work? Are there any liens on the property, et cetera? Uh, now I wanna highlight uh, something about the brownfield definition. So the Connecticut general uh, statutes defines brownfields as any abandoned or underutilized site where redevelopment, reuse or expansion has not occurred due to the presence or potential presence of pollution in the buildings, soil, or groundwater that requires investigation or remediation before or in conjunction with the redevelopment, reuse or expansion of the property. So DECD will be making sure that the proposed project meets this statutory definition of a brownfield. Projects proposed on sites that do not meet the statutory definition of a brownfield will not be considered for funding. Now, some aspects that DCD will consider in determining whether a site meets the statutory definition of a brownfield include, but are not limited to whether the property is abandoned or underutilized, and whether the presence or potential presence of pollution is the primary obstacle preventing the site from being redeveloped, reused, or expanded, given the condition of the site. Now, please look out for the notice of uh, uh, funding availability and the frequently asked uh, questions document that provide information on funding amounts, award criteria, deadlines for submission. Again, this is on our website, www.ctbrownfields.gov. I want to briefly talk about our land bank program because this is a potential entity you could be partnering with on your project. Now, Brownfield Land Bank is a non-stock corporation certified by the DCD and backed by at least two municipalities and can operate and conduct activities related to Brownfield redevelopment that otherwise would be a liability for a municipality. So basically a Brownfield Land Bank can acquire, retain, remediate and sell Brownfields for the benefit of member municipalities and can engage in all other activities required for assisting with redevelopment of a brand field. Land banks can reduce liability exposure due to state and federal regulations. Now, brownfield land banks can also apply to all of uh, DCD slash OBRD grants and loans and the liability relief programs. Thus, there is a potential for a developer to partner with them in obtaining a grant. Three brownfield land banks have been certified to date the Connecticut Brownfield Land Bank, Inc., the New Colony Development Corporation, and the Eastern Connecticut Land Bank, Inc. I would like to emphasize that the three Brownfield Land Banks are approved to operate anywhere in the state. Moving on to some success stories around the state, Brownfield funding was combined with other public funding and private financing to redevelop brownfields in these, on, uh, on these sites. Now, this is a picture of brownfield cleanup work in the South End in Stamford. 
DCD invested in approximately 16 million in various projects and phases of this multi-phased mixed use TOD project, the Harbor Point project, leveraging over 1.5 billion in investment by the BLT company. Brownfield Fund supported remediation of over 90 acres of property occupied by the former Yale and Town, Pitney Bowes, Northeast Utilities, Petrofuel, and the Manger Electric properties. All of these properties have been transferred from empty brownfields into productive modern tax generating uses. The development overlooks uh, Stamford Harbor and consists of more than 4,000 residential units, a hotel complex, other retail office and commercial space. It's a half mile walk to the Stamford train station and is home to the world headquarters for several Fortune 500 companies. So the next example is from the city of Bridgeport. Brownfield loan of, a, of a, over a, a little over a million was awarded to the Bridgeport Historic Ventures LLC and was used for environmental investigation, partial demolition and interior abatement of the 1904 abandoned security building, which was one of three interconnected historic and vacant buildings, the Harrell, the security and the Wheeler buildings in downtown North Historic Village district of Bridgeport. These buildings have been redeveloped into the HSW building 11,000 square feet of commercial retail space on the ground floor and 70 market rate and affordable residential units on the floors above. The next example is from the capital city built in 1902 and abandoned and vacant since 1985 until it was redeveloped in 2017, 2018. This is the former Capewell horse nail factory in Hartford. Contaminants including asbestos, lead, volatile organic, organic compounds and heavy metals, as well as PCBs were dealt with. Uh, DC provided a 3.5 million low interest loan to the developer CIL, Corporation for Independent Living for abatement and remediation. And the property is now called uh, uh, Cap uh, Capel Lofts, was redeveloped into 72 units of housing, including 15 affordable units and 5,000 square feet of commercial space. Thank you everyone. And I know we are going to take uh, questions at the end of the three presentation. I'll now hand over uh, to uh, Alexandra. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for having me. And Benu, thank you for being wonderfully thorough as always. Uh, this program would not be able to take one step forward without Benu. So we're, we should all be very grateful to her for her amazing detail. If you can uh, go to the next slide, please. Great. So I'm tasked with sort of uh, the, the extra bonus programming today. Obviously, we're mostly talking about brownfields, but that would be a good opportunity since there is a lot of overlap between, in our state in particular, there's a lot of overlap between the types of sites Benu was discussing, brownfield sites, um, and you know typically that mill type site we were, we were looking at and opportunity zones. And so we thought it might be a good chance to give people just a bit of a introduction. I'm gonna, I'll warn you, I'm gonna give a 101. So for folks who are familiar with the program, this will be a bit of, this will be repetitive, but we thought it'd be good to give a bit of a 101 of the federal program and also of what Connecticut is doing to encourage investment within, within opportunity zones. So for those not familiar, it's a, opportunity zones is, was part of the federal tax and Tax Cut and Jobs Act in 2017. And really this is, people ask me how to elevate or pitch the Opportunity Zone program as it is a large part of, large part of what we think about at DECD. But the elevator pitch is really, if you have, if your client, if your investor developer has capital gains, they can defer paying taxes on those capital gains until 2026 if they invest the amount into a qualified opportunity business or property. In this case, obviously, I'll focus on property given the topic of today's webinar. And then in addition to deferring paying the capital gains on the previous, uh, the tax on the previous capital gains, they can also get reduction in and potentially complete elimination in the taxes they would need to pay on future capital gains on the investment that's made today in the qualified opportunity property, ideally in a brownfield. Uh, I think that covers this slide. Yep, we'll go to the next one, please, Benu. So want to mention, as I, as I said, opportunity zones are a huge priority for DECD. I want to mention some of the ways in which we're trying to encourage investment, encourage economic activity within our opportunity zones. And we have 72 opportunity zones 
in 27 municipalities in the state, which does cover a nice, a nice chunk of our, a nice chunk specifically of our urban areas in particular. We did, a, we passed a public act 1954 and it really drives home the legislature's priority on uh, with their placing on opportunity zones and DECD is tasked with enacting many of the portion, many of the initiatives within that act. For example, uh, the deputy commissioner, that would be me. Prim I'm the primary contact for all OZ programs from the, from the feds. If they wanna know what's going on in Connecticut and opportunity zones, they reach out to me and uh, we, any, anyone in Connecticut should also think of me as the primary contact for opportunity zone programs. We hold office hours once a week, every Thursday afternoon, and get a really amazing variety of small business owners, large investors, property owners, municipalities, economic development professionals who come in, who sign up to just ask you know, a 15 minute question about whether they're new to the program or very, very well informed and have a specific question about Connecticut, please please feel free to take advantage of those of those office hours and they're posted on our website, which I believe there's a link for that in a couple of slides. So we are the primary DECD and I mean in particular, we are your contact as it relates to anything opportunity zone related in Connecticut. We are also required and happy to happy to fulfill this requirement. We are required to give preference to brownfield projects located in an opportunity zone. And you mentioned that as she went through the criteria, the scoring criteria for the for the application that's open now. And it's also that that same premise applies in historic tax credits and other in investment tax credits that DECD manages. Those all also provide a benefit. I call it bonus points. Uh, these are all competitive programs, and so it. it Properties that are in projects, properties that are in opportunity zones are more competitive as a result of the in opportunity zones. We, fourth bullet here, you know, we, this is something that we spend a lot of time doing, hard to, hard to quantify, hard to track, but we spend a lot of time trying to introduce businesses to investors or property owners to developers. And again, that's where the office hours come in, you know, please let us know if that's you have an idea if you're looking to invest, if you're a property owner, et cetera, and maybe there's a match out there that we are aware of. It's imperfect. I wish I had a database of every business or every property that's looking for funds in, in the state, but we're, we're working on it. We're trying, to, we're trying to create some good institutional knowledge and, and match folks together. And then lastly, we, we've, we're, we've conducted a study and with all the other agencies that touch opportunity zones, in particular deep is um, is instrumental often in permitting we on how the state can incentivize the use of the program. So a lot of what I've mentioned today came out of that study and help, helping us. And every state is working on this, and I think Kenneth is doing a good job. You know, every study is every state is trying to figure out what is it that the state can do to incentivize activity when really the benefits come on your federal tax return. So there's we're in a position of not having all the power, but trying to influence, trying to stimulate with what the tools that we do have at, at our disposal. And so I think we're doing a good job of that so far. And I hope that you will all take advantage of this, uh, take advantage of Opportunity Zone advantages uh, and tax benefits if possible. And if nothing else, you know, at least it will help being located in Opportunity will help with all the other funding programs that DECD has. Um, can we go to the next slide? This is just a map to show you where they're located. It's, it's somewhat predictable in, in that we're clustered around our urban centers for the most part, with a few exceptions. And there's a lot more details. If we can go to the next slide, hopefully, yep, yeah, there's the link right at the top of the page. So there's, we have great resources on our Connecticut Opportunity Zone website, including a decent database of projects that we're always working to, always working to expand. I say projects, I mean really property, real estate property that's in opportunity zones, that's looking for investors, that's looking for development, um, along with a whole other host of whole other host of resources. So I think that is my last slide and I'll end there. Excellent. Yep, there's my contact information. There's the news. And um, depending on whether it's brownfields or opportunity zones, we are at your disposal. I put on the cover of my presentation the former U.S. Baird uh, factory on Stratford Avenue in Stratford that has become the largest brewery in Connecticut and I have been there they have very tasty beer 
and that is a real growing trend in cleaning up brownfields and making them into breweries. And if, if nothing else holds your attention, thinking about the fact that brownfields can become breweries is a great thing. Next slide, please. My philosophy about brownfields is kind of summarized by this, this slide. Brownfields are a resource for the future and also a link to our past. You may be familiar with Weir Farms Historic National Historic Park in Wilton and Ridgefield. And it is our only state park, or right now it's our only state park, and it was the home of the famous landscape painter J. Alvin Weir. He painted this picture of the romantic uh, thread mill in 1893. The original of this picture is hanging in the Brooklyn Museum of Art. It turns out that Mr. Weir, although he lived in uh, in Wilton in Ridgeville for a long time, he married a woman who, from Wyndham and paint this picture. The Wyndham Mills was cleaned up and doesn't look that much different from what it looked like in the late 19th century. The message here is if brownfields could be a resource back in the 19th century, they're still a resource today. Next slide, please. The definition of a brownfield, the new did a great job in covering the statutory definition in state law of a brownfield. I would just emphasize that not every contaminated property is a brownfield. If a property is being cleaned up by a company and is still in active use, and this might be, in, say, our property transfer program, or if the company is just doing the cleanup you know, without actually formally being enrolled in the program, then the site is probably not a brownfield. The key is that the contamination or the perceived contamination is a barrier to the reuse of the property. Next slide, please. Why clean up brownfields? Again, Benu did a great job in covering why we want to clean up brownfields. I would argue that the most central reason is that it protects the environment and it strengthens the economy. Some people have argued that protecting the environment and, uh, and economic development, economic advancement are at conflict with one another. I would argue the opposite. You can't have a healthy economy without having a healthy environment. Next slide, please. The state cleanup requirements, whether they're in one of our brownfield programs or whether they're in the property transfer program, the voluntary remediation program, or any of our other programs, are all defined by our remediation standard regulations. Those regulations apply to all cleanups. They define the cleanup endpoints. The regulations are 60 or 70 pages long, and they're very complicated and technical. Once a year, DEP teaches a day-long course in the ins and outs of their mediation standard regulations. We're not going to get into that today, but just think of their mediation standard regulations as a toolbox for getting sites cleaned up. They define how you get the sites, not how you get the sites cleaned up, but what the endpoint is. Next slide, please. One of the first tools in our toolbox for protecting potential developers of brownfields from liability is the covenant not to sue. There are two types or flavors of covenants not to sue. One's under Connecticut General Statute 22A-133AA. This is transferable to a new developer. Uh, it gives a lot of protection. Uh, the two main protections are if after the site is cleaned up, the regulations become more strict, you are absolved from uh, further liability. Or if after doing a great job investigating a site and cleaning it up, you find some contamination that just was not previously discovered. And the example I always use for this is an underground storage tank that you stumble across in a later phase of construction. You won't have to clean that up. And you have to pay a fee equal to 3% of the appraised value of the property, appraised as if it's not contaminated. You can think of that as an insurance premium that's compensating the taxpayers for the risk that they're undertaking by extending that protection. It's free to municipalities and for private sector folks, if paying that fee is going to be a hardship, we can set up a payment plan for it, basically. There's also a covenant not to sue under 22A-133BB. This is not transferable to a new entity. 
and it offers less protections and it actually doesn't have a fee. I haven't seen a whole lot of covenants not to sue under 22A133BB. Next slide, please. The abandoned brownfield cleanup program, Benu briefly mentioned that, that's run by the uh, Department of Economic and Community Development. And this is a liability relief program that in, to get into this, the property has to either be abandoned, which is pretty much what it sounds like, or significantly underutilized for at least five years. And significantly underutilized is kind of in the eye of the beholder. An example might be a mill that was partially occupied and partially vacant and the businesses in it have been winding down for some period of time. If you have questions on this, I would, on eligibility, I would encourage you to reach out to DECD, the new, or to me, and we can work through this. It has to be, well, there's a whole bunch of other uh, qualifications here, but one of the big things is that you have to apply to DECD and be accepted into the program before you take title to the property. We've been telling people to allow us two months to complete and complete the uh, vetting of the application. Sometimes we can do it more quickly, but right now we actually have a lot of programs in you know, in the waiting room for this program, and it's taking probably closer to 60 days. Once you acquire the property, you have to enroll in. DEP is Voluntary Remediation Program, and you have to remain in that program, and you clean the site up under that program. There's a $3,250 fee for that program. The benefits of this are, first of all, you're exempt from the property transfer program if the site happens to be subject to the property transfer program. You don't have to investigate or clean up any contamination that is emanating from the site. You do have to stop contamination that's emanating from the site, but again, you don't have to clean it up. And the most common example of this would be groundwater contamination that's originating from your site and flowing off the site. But it could also be things like uh, contaminated sediment, things like that. You also are exempt from liability to third parties. This is really more of a legal defense against uh, liability to third parties. Let's say somebody sues you and says, that the contamination on the site has injured me in some way, either that's financially or it's actually injured my health. Uh, the other benefit of this is once the site is cleaned up, you can get a covenant not to sue under 22A133AA, and you don't have to pay the fee that a couple of slides ago I said that normally would be 3% of the value of the property appraised as if it were not contaminated. Next slide, please. We also have the brownfield room. Uh, one more back, please. There you go. Uh, the brownfield radiation revitalization program is also a DECD program. It's similar in a lot of ways to the abandoned brownfield cleanup program, or we call that the ABC program. You need to be a bona fide prospective purchaser, which is the most common route into the program, an innocent property owner or a contiguous landowner. Something I want to point out here is that the innocent property owner, municipalities are by statute innocent property owners as long as the contamination isn't something that they caused. So the, the most common use of this is if a municipality acquires a property and wants to clean it up and redevelop it. Municipalities as innocent landowners can get into this program after they take title to the property. Otherwise, for bona fide prospective purchasers, again, they have to apply and be approved before taking title. And similar to the abandoned brownfield cleanup program, please allow 60 days from the time you submit your completed and good application for us to turn this around. Again, you don't have to investigate off-site contamination or remediate off-site contamination, but if something is migrating off the site, you have to stop it from migrating off the site. You'll have to investigate and clean up the site within the site boundaries. You get, again, that exemption from state uh, liability and third-party liability, as long as you do what you said you were going to do. You're, again, exempted from the Transfer Act. For this program, there is a fee that is equal to 5% of the value of just the land based on the most recent municipal grant list, not including buildings or other improvements. So it's a really easy calculation. Just look at the assessor's card and you'll know what the fee is going to be. And that's payable in two installments. One is due six months after you take title to the property, and the other is due four years after you're accepted into the program. And something that's actually really important is there's no fee for municipalities 
if a municipality acquires a site and flips it to a developer, they won't pay that fee. But when they flip it to a developer, the developer will pay the fee someplace down the road. Between the two programs, the abandoned brownfield cleanup program is a little bit simpler and more straightforward. The brownfield remediation revitalization program has a few more bells and whistles. One of the big bells and whistles of brownfield remediation revitalization program is it has a clause that allows the protections to be transferred from the original party that was accepted into the program to, let's say, a developer acquires a site, cleans it up, and then transfers it to somebody else that's actually going to operate apartment buildings on it, that somebody else that they transfer it to can apply and be accepted into this program as long as they can show that they didn't cause the contamination or have any relationship with the person or persons that did cause the contamination. Next slide, please. The Municipal Brownfield Liability Relief Program is actually run by DEEP. And as the name implies, it's open to municipalities. It's also now open to uh, Connecticut Brownfield land banks and to municipal development corporations. They can't be responsible parties. The application is really simple. I'd say allow a month from the time they receive a good application. It exempts you from third party liability and from the Transfer Act. This is not a cleanup program. This is a holding pattern for municipalities or land banks to acquire a site and then either figure out what they want to do with it long term or and or find a developer to get the site cleaned up. You need to submit a plan and a schedule to quote unquote facilitate the investigation, remediation and redevelopment of the site. And this is something that we can work with you on for any one of these programs. Again, I would encourage you when you're in the very early stages of looking at a site reach out to Benu at DECD or reach out to me. And we are very happy to set up a meeting with you, if you're a municipality, if you're a developer or whoever. And one of the benefits also of these programs is that one of my jobs as the Brownfields coordinator is to do exactly that, coordinate within DEP. If somebody needs an application for a discharge permit or something like that, it's my job to make sure that the application is not sitting on somebody's desk for too long and to keep things moving. Not that anything would ever sit on anybody's desk at DEP for, DEP for too long, but in the theoretical event that, that did happen, that's my job to make sure it doesn't happen uh, for too long. Next slide, please. There's also a statute, uh, Connecticut General Statute 22A 133DD, that gives municipalities access to properties to investigate them for brownfield redevelopment purposes. And there's five different things. They're all here on the screen. There's five different ways that a site can qualify for this. And first, if the owner can't be located, this would be the classical mill where the owners are long gone. If the municipality has a tax lien on the property, if the municipality has filed an, a notice of eminent domain to uh, take the property that way, or the last two are if the municipality finds that investigation is in the public interest to determine that the property should be redeveloped. I'm sorry, I'm reading this to you, but here we mean the legislative body, the municipality. This would be the town council, the city council, the board of selectmen, somebody like that. Or the last instance is if a municipal official determines basically that getting out of the property is necessary to protect human health or the environment. And this is where a municipality is exercising its police power to protect human health or the environment. That could be the building official, that could be the director of health, it could be the fire marshal, it could be really pretty much anybody. And the municipality must give 45 days notice by sending a certified letter to the last known address of the person that owns the property. And the only way that the owner of the property can keep the town or the city off of the site is by filing a suit in superior court. And if they owe taxes, they have to pay the taxes. And they also have to show that they are doing the same investigation that the town was going to do and they have to provide a copy of that investigation when it's done. This statute also protects LEPs, licensed environmental professionals, that do this work on behalf of a town. This is a very powerful statute 
We are not always directly involved with this. It happens to be in uh, Title 22A, but the EEP is not really directly involved with these all the time. I would say, though, if you are a city or a town that is thinking about using the statute to get onto a property, please give us a call. And there's probably other things that DECD and DEP can help you with. And this actually is also available to Connecticut Brownfield Land Banks. Next slide, please. One of the most important things to think about at redevelopment of brownfields is flood, man flood management certifications. I have the statutory citation up here. This is not directly a dirty dirt contaminated property type thing, but basically anytime the state is putting money into a project, and that is whether it's DECD, the Department of Housing, or any other agency, there has to be a flood management certification if the site is in a flood zone. And critical activities, critical activities most often are uh, housing, but it could be uh, schools, it could be a hospital, uh, hazardous waste storage, things like that, have to be above the 500 year flood elevation. And you have to have dry entry and exit that is a way to get in and out that is above the 100 year flood elevation. And the thinking behind this is that it's great that a site is above the 500 year flood elevation, but if you're on an island uh, during a flood and you can't get in or out, that could be a real problem. Other activities have to be one foot above the 100 year flood elevation. We do have some very limited exceptions for mills. And you basically, you can redevelop within the old footprint of a mill. I would suggest reaching out to DEP's Land and Water Resources Division in the very early stages of a project, because I've seen some unfortunate cases where folks have waited until the very last minute to reach out on this, and that can delay a project. It can take several months to get the flood management certification. And just to be clear, whichever state agency is providing the funding has to get the flood management certification, but they will be working with the developer and the developer's engineers to get the flood management certification. Next slide, please. Connecticut Brownfield Land Banks, the new did a great job of covering uh, Connecticut Brownfield Land Banks. I would just say that they are a really important tool and there are some municipalities that don't want to be in the chain of title on a brownfield. And that's where a Connecticut Brownfield Land Bank can step in and, uh, and acquire that property instead of the municipality directly owning it. And the, the Benu did a great job of talking about all the other services that they uh, provide, like education and things like that. Next slide, please. The Connecticut Brownfields Initiative is a public-private partnership that was set up three or four years ago and it's run by Yukon out in stores, and there are private sector donors, uh, uh, environmental lawyers among them, uh, some of the licensed environmental professionals and engineering firms. DEP is part of this partnership, DECD is part of this partnership. And the idea is to help out municipalities, and well, actually, uh, it could be nonprofit entities too, when they apply for EPA brownfield grants. We didn't talk about EPA brownfield grants, but I will say that EPA has an annual competition for brownfield grants. Usually applications open up in the summer and they're due in the fall. And this is also a workforce development program in that students at UConn work with the cities and towns to actually help them prepare their applications for brownfield grants and they take a course in the fall where they actually prepare those applications. They learn about doing phase one and phase two environmental site assessments. And there has been actually a very good success rate. I would say over 50% of the sites that go through the Yukon uh, Connecticut Brownfields Initiative and submit their application uh, to EPA have been selected by EPA. And that's a great, great success rate. The, the EPA grants are even more competitive than DECD grants. And one example is the town of Stafford, which received an, an EPA grant in June of 2019. The last couple of years, Don Friday of DECD and I have been among the judges that go and listen 
well now it's virtual, uh, virtual uh, two presentations at the end of the fall semester at UConn by the students in this program. And I'm always just super, super impressed with the quality of the presentations and with the quality of the thinking behind these. And it's kind of comforting to me to know that there are some folks coming up behind us that will hopefully step into the field of brownfield redevelopment, but they're already making an impact today in helping cities and towns get grants. And they have the contact information for the two UConn professors that run this program. I strongly encourage cities and towns to reach out to uh, Maria or Nefeli, the two professors, if they are interested in this program. Next slide, please. EPA Brownfield Grants, I, I do have a, a quick slide here about all the different flavors of EPA Brownfield Grants. They're similar to DECD's grants, but like I said, they're even more competitive. DECD has a, a much bigger pool of money. Not the two Connecticut's weren't too much, but we will anyhow a little bit. Connecticut has actually, since 2011, put more money into Brownfield Grants and loans than EPA has put into brownfield grants and loans for the entire country. I don't mean that as a uh, criticism of EPA. I just mean to say that Connecticut has realized the importance of cleaning up and redeveloping brownfields. Next slide, please. DEEP has a, what we call the Municipal Prepared Workbook. This lives on the website of the DEEP Remediation Division. There's a hot link you know, later down in this, uh, about the fourth bullet point here. And to somebody who asked in the audience earlier, these slides will be provided to folks uh, after this presentation is over. So you'll be able to click on these hot links. But basically what the prepared workbook is, is a guide to the process of brownfield redevelopment, especially aimed at cities and towns. And it starts at the beginning with how does the town become involved with a brownfield? Do we actually want to take title to the property and, and clean it up, redevelop it, and flip it to somebody? Do we want to not become or not directly acquire the site, but have a private sector developer help us out? Or do we want to have some level, lesser level of involvement? And the product of this or the work product of this is a series of worksheets. Most of them are Microsoft Word. There's one about the financing, which is, I guess, not surprisingly in Microsoft Excel. And these are meant just to help the city or the town document their thinking on a brownfield as they go through the process. And it's not meant to be something that you have to hand in these worksheets and to be another bureaucratic form that you have to fill out, but it's meant to just help you think because a lot of these sites can take multiple years to redevelop. And it's nice to have a record of what you were thinking on a particular, uh, at a particular stage in the investigation and cleanup. There are links to DEP, DECD, and at the federal level, EPA programs. Again, this is on our website, and I'm proud to say that this was something that was generically on EPA's website. It was not state-specific. Connecticut was the first state to develop a state-specific version of the prepared workbook. We worked with the EPA Region 1 folks and with our contractor to develop something that we hope was going to be a model for other states. And because of my rule about always having at least one slide of breweries, I put the former Manger die casting site in Derby, which is now Bad Sons Brewery. And if I'm not mistaken, uh, HRP has an office upstairs of the brewery. I bet that's a really good recruiting tool. Next slide, please. One other thing is that Connecticut has been working for years to transform our cleanup programs. Public Act 20-9 was passed last year, and the legislature actually passed this unanimously, which is a pretty remarkable thing for the legislature to pass a piece of legislation unanimously. One of the things that this does is it's going to eventually sunset the Transfer Act after DEP adopts regulations. This is not going to kick sites that are already in the Transfer Act out of the Transfer Act. Sites that are currently enrolled in the Transfer Act will have to finish and finish what they were doing in the Transfer Act. But eventually sites will not have to enter the Transfer Act. 
This will create an expectation that when a release is found on a site, if it's above a certain, if the contamination concentrations or amounts are above a certain threshold, you'll have to report that and clean it up. DECD and DEP are required to co-chair public stakeholder working groups, and that's going on right now. There are five subcommittees that are starting off their discussions on how to deal with different aspects of assessing and cleaning up sites. Most of the subgroups are meeting on a weekly basis, and those meetings are open to anybody that wants to attend them. They're being done remotely through Zoom like everything else right now. There's a hot link here to information on the uh, schedule and more details. And the, the larger working group, which has a bunch of members that were named in the legislation, in the legislation and they are uh, people like the Connecticut Business and Industries, Industry Association, environmental groups, it's just a broad cross section of, of Connecticut uh, are represented on this working group. The second thing that we are doing is the remediation stead regulations, which I talked about in one of my first slides, wave two of the amendments to the remediation stead regulations was approved by the Legislative Review Committee of the State Legislature last week. Also, changes to environmental use restrictions. If you're not familiar with how Connecticut adopts and changes regulations, we're one of the few states where the legislature actually has to approve changes to regulations. And we've had to go back to the legislature two or three times to just make these clearer and better. And that's actually a really good thing because it, it makes the regulation stronger. But the next step is that these were submitted last week to the Secretary of the State. We expect that in the next week or two, once the Secretary of the State publishes these regulations, they will become official and people can begin to use them. We will have a transition period where we will allow people to, if they started doing their cleanups under the uh, current version of the, or the previous version, I should say, of the RSRs, they'll be able to, to finish up probably by, if they get their cleanup done by some date that we haven't figured out exactly what it is yet. But eventually the wave two amendments will kick in, or eventually people will all have to use the wave two amendments. And people will now be able to use environmental use restrictions instead of just environmental land use restrictions. Environmental use restrictions are a little bit easier to use. The, the whole intent of this is to make it easier for people to clean sites up to make it go better, faster, and cheaper, and to give you more flexibility, like my second bullet point there says. Next slide, please. A couple of examples. Benu had some great examples of the success of some of our brownfield cleanup programs. I have a couple more. This is Bridgeport, down in the State Street area of Bridgeport. The old Bryant Electric building has been cleaned up and put back to use as at least four different businesses, and I think there are even more now. One of these, the Chavez Bakery, is especially near and dear to my heart because uh, they make really awesome rolls, and very often my lunch includes a, a roll from Chavez Bakery. Next slide, please. Killingly Commons. And Killingly, up in the northeast corner of the state, is a former glass factory that actually made a recycled glass to make new bottles. and that has been cleaned up and the site has been put back to use and has been for the past, let's say 10 years or so, a major regional shopping center, which fulfilled a real need up in that part of the state. The, the uh, local residents in Killingly and the surrounding towns were just really thrilled, first of all, to have the site cleaned up because it was an eyesore that you could see from Interstate 395 and to have a bunch of new stores in the area. Next slide, please. Just to show that brownfield redevelopment is not just about creating housing and shopping centers, it's also important for people to have a place to recreate and play. In the Occam section of Norwich, the Occam Park redevelopment project, this factory was destroyed back in 1988 by a fire, and this was developed into a really awesome park which benefits the community now and fills just a, a real need. Now, I think that illustrates that we have shifted our thinking over the years from thinking about brownfields just as a job creation economic development program to thinking a little bit more holistically 
that it's also about the, the community part of economic and community development. Next slide, please. My philosophy again towards brownfield redevelopment can be also summarized by this slide. I took these two pictures in Norwich at an oil terminal on the banks of the Thames River about a mile south of downtown. The city of Norwich is talking about acquiring this oil terminal and redeveloping it. I was standing in exactly the same, same spot when I took both of these pictures. The first picture is looking inward at cracked pavement with weeds growing out of it and these kind of dilapidated buildings. But I literally turned 90 degrees and looked out of the Thames River. This was a nice, cold, crisp winter day and looked at how beautiful the setting really was. So to me, it is not only a team sport cleaning up brownfields, but you have to be an optimist. You have to be a glasses half full person to see the potential the brownfields present. My next slide is really just my contact information and I guess we'll open it up to questions. Thank you, Mark. Yes, HRP does have an office next to Bad Sons, the brewery there. We're a big fan of Brownfields turned brewery and it's one of our favorite places for meetings. I would again like to thank each of our speakers. Hopefully you now have a better understanding of how these programs and financial mechanisms available through the DEEP and DECD may be beneficial to you and who you can reach out to should you have future questions. It's a little past our scheduled hour now. I know that Alexandra had a hard stop at 1130. I want to thank her for participating in the presentation today. If Mark and Banu can stay on a few more minutes, we'll transition to the Q&A portion of today's presentation and see if we can't answer a couple. Looking at a few of the questions that were provided in the chat during the session, uh, one question, will, will the PowerPoint presentation be made available? Uh, the PowerPoint presentation, as well as a recording of this presentation, will be provided to each attendee. Uh, Mark and Banu, there's a, a question regarding covenant not to sue. Are land banks exempt from the fee as well as municipalities? Uh, this is Mark, and I, I would have to double check the legislation, but I'm, I'm about 90% certain that uh, land banks are exempt from paying the fee for a covenant not to sue pursuant to 22A133AA. Great. Thank you, Mark. Uh, Banu, you mentioned earlier that lending may not be limited to abandoned properties. Do you have examples of when a property that is not abandoned might be considered? Um, I'm not sure. Um, it, was, was that a question from someone? Uh, I don't recall um, mentioning that, but um, if a property is underutilized, right? So that can be a, 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 um, an example where it could be considered a brownfield. For example, there is a, a property where, you know, only a portion of the property is more functioning now as a business, uh, but there is scope to redevelop the whole property. Uh, so, um, you know, that would be a case where, um, you know, the property is not abandoned, but it's underutilized and therefore can be considered as a brownfield. Is, uh, was that the specific question? I hope I'm... That was a question as provided, um, perhaps Banu, that's one we can provide to, to attendees afterwards. We can maybe flesh yeah, that out a little sure, further. Sure. Or certainly the person Please asking the question me. can reach out to me directly and mm -hmm, we'll provide mm -hmm. her contact information after this presentation. Yeah, absolutely. This is Mark, if I could add just a little bit, uh, I, I think you hit it exactly right, Banu. And but one example I think of is there's a lot of old mills Mm -hmm. that are no longer functioning as a mill, but somebody somebody owns it and they are renting out portions of it to, I don't know, artists is a fairly typical example. And uh, maybe there's a retail shop or something in it, but, but parts of the mill are just sitting there unused and languishing. And 
that those are ones that we would consider without question to be underutilized. I mean, it, it just passes the straight face test for Thank that. You. Thanks, Mark. Great. Thank you, Benu and Mark. Another question here. How has the Brownfields program changed over the last few years? Um, so over the last few years, so this particular year, this is the first time that the new administration um, is, uh, you know, rolling out um, a, a grant and loan offering. Uh, so we are kind of uh, the, the proposed changes that I presented uh, today, we are kind of trying to learn from uh, experience of the last two, eight years. Um, and uh, for example, um, we've noticed that uh, our brownfield dollars going for uh, a project that has a redevelopment vision, those are the most successful. Um, uh, one. So that is why we are giving uh, extra points to uh, a more shovel ready project. Previously, you know, oh, I think in the beginning stages of the Brownfield program, uh, the emphasis was on um, let us get the sites shovel ready, then developers will come. Uh, there are a few examples where we did that, and in spite of doing that, the developer may not have come immediately. And we are seeing, uh, you know, examples where um, you, you, we have the whole plan in mind, the remediation piece, planning piece, and the redevelopment piece. Those seem to be more um, uh, effective, cost efficient, and, uh, you know, actually happening. Um, so... So we are trying to go, now I think the Brownfield program has kind of uh, matured. Um, and so we are all as a state in, in terms of Brownfield redevelopment, we are a stage where we should be thinking like that. So that's uh, one place where we are heading to. And the other thing that we, um, that we are doing is, I think I tried to uh, bring that out in my presentation. We are going back to the mission, our primary mission of uh, Brownfield redevelopment. Um, going back to why we, why we have this program. Um, and so going back to the definition of brownfields and trying to actually, you know, try to revitalize those sites, those sites that don't have a chance without our funding, those sites that don't have a chance to get remediated and redeveloped while uh, pushing for the mission of DCD for economic and community development. I hope I answered the question. Thank you, Benu. Mm -hmm. uh, let's see, maybe we can try to pick up one or two more questions here. Um, looking through the, the list here. Um, Does brownfield only impact industrial zone sites or would farmland also be applicable? Um, farmland would definitely uh, be applicable um, if you know they have a plan that if the farmland is not being used uh, for farming and if there is um, you know issue about uh, contamination in the soil and groundwater, uh, that is that could be um, uh, eligible. And for those who are not familiar with our uh, recent announcement, along with the uh, notice of funding availability, we have a frequently asked questions document um, and both the grant and loan have already have a question of what DCD, some examples that DCD considers uh, for, you know, does it um, examples of uh, brownfield uh, um, projects uh, would this be considered a brownfield? Would that be considered a brownfield? And I think we have an example, a farmland example. And that says that if there is some farmland uh, that has an issue, I could be wrong now. I may have had it in the draft, but you know, uh, uh, farmlands can be considered a brownfield. Yes, yeah. so, no, I would just add that 
DEP's Remediation Division has on its website guidance for people that are considering redevelopment of farmland, the obvious concerns being the presence of pesticides. And uh, oh, about 10 years ago, that was a big, a big uh, trend. Apple orchards being redeveloped into, uh, into housing. And this just provides a little bit of guidance on how to manage the contaminated soil. That's not directly a brownfield related thing. But it's something I just want to point out for anybody that might be dealing with redevelopment of farmland. That being said, we also policy-wise think carefully about protecting farmland to the extent that we can. Uh, Thank you for your responses, Mark and and Benu, and your answers to those questions. Uh, Well, that brings us to the end of the presentation. Thank you to the presenters and for everyone attended this morning. As mentioned earlier, we'll provide responses to the questions we were not able to get to today via email, along with reference material and contact information for each of our presenters. I hope everyone enjoys the rest of their week. Thank you. Thank you.